What is going on, you guys? It is The Talking Sasquatch. Thanks for coming back. Today, we've got some extra special content. I was lucky enough to spend over two hours talking to DEF CON presenter Betsy about NFC and RFID, so I can help you guys understand how all this works. Now, there's a ton of misconceptions and misinformation going around out there about what the flipper can and can't do. I've heard people say they're using their flipper as their bank card. I've seen people using them at Dave & Buster's, trying to make it look like you can just go in and use them and do whatever you want, but None of this is real. So I'm here today to explain how all of it works. Sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. So let's start off with RFID. So one of the interesting things is that Flipper actually uses the term RFID slightly loosely. What they're really actually referring to is 125 kilohertz or 134 kilohertz. These cards are super basic. They use what's known as tag talks first. And what happens is as soon as you introduce your RFID card to an electromagnetic field of the reader, it starts screaming out its UID or unique identification number for all the world to hear. This information never changes. So as soon as you capture it, you have it and you can recreate it. That's why Flipper's so good at recreating RFID tag. So that being said, knowing that it's such a low security system, a company called Indala came ahead and they're like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to encrypt it. So we're going to add a cipher to it and we're going to make it so that people can't just read these and use them over and over again. The problem is it was a stationary target. All people had to do is decipher their cipher and then boom, we can recreate and we can decrypt these in dollar codes, which now you can do with the flipper. That's really all there is to RFID. It's just a unique identification number that's given to a reader. The reader allows access or doesn't allow access. It's as simple as that. It's literally just a key. And if your key can unlock the lock, you have access. That's it. Now we get into the fun part, which is NFC. NFC is super broad. There's so many different types. We're gonna kind of breeze over the most common types and the simplest stuff, at least in this video. If it gets a lot of popularity and people ask for it, we can take a deep dive. I've got so much more information that I talked about with Betsy. I would love to share it with you, but for now, we're just gonna do the simple stuff. So let's start off with the most basic NFC tags, the Type 2 NFCs. These are the NTAG 213s and the NTAG 215s. These only hold up to about a half a kilobyte of data, but actually that's still a lot for what they do. One of the main benefits of these cards is that they're super cheap and they're super simple. You can do things like store business cards on them. They work kind of like a QR code. Uh, you can hold a pretty good amount of data. You can even hold images on it, uh, but there's not a lot of security behind them. One of the main downsides to the cards is that they actually have very little access control. It's only got a four byte password. And the interesting thing about the four byte password is you can actually go right up to the reader and then read the reader itself. The reader will actually give the password to the NFC card. So if you can intercept that, you can use that password to decrypt the NFC card that you have and then emulate it. The upside to the card is that even though they're low security, they're also super cheap. So you'll see these things used for day passes for mass transit and things that really don't require ultra high security. That brings us to My Fair Classic. This is one of the things that we see people using all the time and everybody's asking questions about these. So it's a really cool topic to dive into. Now, Flipper supports an NFC A 14443A protocol, which is what MyFair Classic uses. However, they do have proprietary language. So the flipper can see it like reading a sign, but they can see that there's letters on the sign, but they can't actually understand what those letters are. So it's a little tricky the way it's implemented. So what the flipper does is it's gonna go through and use what's called a dictionary attack. You have a dictionary with a bunch of keys in it, and it's gonna use those keys to try to decipher the card itself. Now, this is where it gets just a little tricky. What happens is that card has 16 different sectors on it. Each of those sectors has a number of key slots. In order to unlock the card, you need to basically match a key from your dictionary to every one of the key slots that's on each of the sectors. Good news, not not every one of those key slots is full of real information. If you were to get a factory, fresh, unwritten card, every single one of those key slots in every single one of those sectors is gonna be full of Fs, which is just basically a blank card. Not every card fills every key slot in every sector. So chances are there's gonna be a whole bunch of sectors and a whole bunch of keys that are written with blank information. That makes it so much easier for us to decipher what's on that card. 
Furthermore, there's a bunch of kind of standard keys out there that are factory keys, that are default keys, things like that. They're placed really high up in the dictionary, which means that the flipper is going to try those keys before they try some more obscure keys that were maybe added later on. This makes the whole process significantly faster. That being said, having the biggest dictionary isn't necessarily the best thing. What can happen is you could have a dictionary that has keys that aren't used anywhere near you. You could be trying to unlock a hotel key and you're running codes from gym keys. Like just having the biggest dictionary does not make it the fastest thing in the world. Keeping in mind, there's thousands and thousands of items in these dictionaries and it could literally take an hour plus just to try to decipher a card. And if you don't have the keys already in your dictionary, it still won't succeed. So that's the problem with trying to just straight up uh, decode MyFair Classic keys with the Flipper Zero. So what's it gotta do? You've got a MyFair Classic key and you don't have the dictionary that has the keys in it. So what do you do? Well, MF Key 32 V2 is actually the solution to this problem. What MF Key 32 V2 does is it allows you to actually take the flipper and scan the reader itself. The reader will produce what are called nonces, which just means number used once. And those nonces can actually be used to create a key. What's really cool is you can actually use Flipper's own web tool to make the keys for you. All you have to do is use the detect reader function on the Flipper, and then you can use the Flipper web tool to create a dictionary based off of those nonces. It will overwrite your current dictionary, keep that in mind, but as soon as you do that, you can decipher the card. You can also do this with the command line interface or CLI or with your phone. What's kind of cool about these MyFair Classic cards is you actually could, if you want to, store different keys in different sectors that could do different things. You could have one card that actually allows you access to multiple different things that have nothing to do with each other. The problem is, Companies don't want to play nice, they don't want to use the same keys and the same cards, so again, they don't do that. But in theory, they could, which is such a missed opportunity because it's such a cool idea. Now, something to know about the MyFair Classic keys is that a lot of times they're used in a really low security way. And when I say this, I mean that basically they'll only have like one key in one sector to decipher. And once you unlock that one key, the card will broadcast its UID or its unique identification number. Now, this UID is taken from the reader and it's sent to some central server somewhere in the back room of some server place, probably not where you're at right now. And that server is what actually tells the reader what that card is going to do. This is where most of the misunderstandings lie. People think that they're used to having bank cards and things like that, that there's actually something stored on this card. And in most cases, there really isn't. So that means even if you copy a card, it's not like you can add money to it. It's not like you can really change anything on that card that's going to be of any value to you. This leads us to the infamous Dave and Buster's video. I'm sure you've all seen it. Somebody goes into Dave and Buster's, they've got their Flipper Zero, they hold it up to one of the arcade machines and it starts letting them play for free. The misconception here is that it's the card that's letting them play for free. The card has very little to do with it. It's actually the server in the back room that's letting it play for free. The reason why this is so important is because as soon as that server sees that that card is being used in multiple locations in a very short amount of time, it's gonna automatically trip an error and it's gonna disable the card. So why can't you just go and download the card from somebody's repo, like Uber's repo? Why is it not on there? It's because it doesn't exist, really. It's the back room that controls it. And again, even if you have the card, it's going to get disabled and it's just not going to work. So maybe for one person who happens to have a flipper and work in David Buster's, they can do it and make the video. But for you and me, it's just not practical. They're immediately going to find out that it's being used and they're going to disable it. So that being said, let's move on to the next thing that people seem to misunderstand, which is bank cards. Bank cards are actually known as Java cards or smart cards because they actually were written in a really basic rudimentary form of Java. The bank cards or the smart cards are actually a computer in and of themselves. They're really, really cool. And they're actually pretty damn complicated, which I mean, if you think about it, it's for a bank for transferring money. So, you know, it's not going to be simple. So why can I take my flipper and scan my bank card and get my credit card number? Well, it's because the flipper has a list of application IDs and it basically asks the card if it has any of this information on the card and that information it will display for you if it happens to be on the card. The thing is, 
the application ID data is virtually useless. Most of the time, if you're lucky, you can get a card number, maybe an expiration date, some relatively useless information that you could just take a picture of the card and get. It's not something you can use to initiate a transfer. Obviously, that leads us to the next question is how do bank cards work? And not surprisingly, it's actually reasonably complicated. Knowing that the cards themselves are mini little computers kind of gives you an idea of how it might actually work. So what happens is you go to a store and you go to pay for something, say a $7 charge. Well, the card reader that you tap your card on is going to ask your card for a $7 transfer. So the card itself sees the ask for a $7 transfer and it signs it with a secret that that card and that card alone knows. Well, actually, it's not just the card that knows it. The bank also knows the secret. So that secret handshake $7 charge is sent back to the bank and then the bank sees that that transaction is coming from that card and since they both share the same secret then they can initiate the transfer and they can let the transaction actually happen so now you're saying Sasquatch all you got to do is know what the secret is that can't be that hard we can just decipher whatever is going from the bank to the card or from the card to the bank well the thing about the secret is it's not static that secret changes every single time the card's used, every single second in some cases, because the secret is tied to a random number generator. And the random number generator can be tied to something like the time of day, the amount in the account, the store that's being used for it, anything. And you have no idea what that is. Think of it this way, it's just like any two-factor authenticator, which uses a authenticator program, like Google Authenticate, there's a ton of them like that. Even Discord set up like this, where you scan a QR code and it basically syncs up a random number between the end user and the server. So basically what happens is the server and the end user both have a synchronized random number. And if you intercept that random number from either side, it changes. So by the time you go to use it, it's already expired and there's a new key. So it doesn't really matter what you do with it, you're not gonna find a good way to intercept the signature and the secret that's required to do a transaction, especially not with a flipper. Furthermore, it can actually get even more complicated because the server itself could actually ask the card for another layer of authentication, send it another secret, which will be changed based off of the original secret, and now you've got an entirely new secret. Again, these things are little computers. They're super, super complicated, and they're made by very, very smart people to make sure that somebody with a $169 hacking device can't steal a credit card. It's for this reason that anytime I see somebody coming into Discord talking about how they clone their credit card and how they're using it, I always like to kind of mess with them a little bit and be like, oh yeah, 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 you know, how'd you do it? What'd you do it with? Because you know it's not true because you just can't do it. The entire system is created to make sure that you cannot do that. I know this has been a bit of a longer video with less of a demonstration and more of just me explaining things, but NFC and RFID are one of the more complicated, one of the more confusing things to understand. Again, I literally spent two hours in a call with Betsy and having him explain exactly how all this stuff works. And then I spent another hour taking notes off of the call just so I could condense it down to the point where hopefully you all can understand how some of these things work. If you wanna know more about NFC or RFID, I can literally make an entirely new 200 level, more complicated video on more of the information from what Betsy sent me. I've got cards I can read. I've got all sorts of cool stuff to show you. If you're interested in it, let me know. And that'll be the next video, or not the next video, but that'll be a video for the future. Furthermore, if you're super interested, you can always join the RFID hacking Discord. Tons of great people in there. Just remember, it is a high level Discord. If you walk in there asking about how to scan your bank cards, they're going to let you find out. So definitely do your homework. And if you have questions, ask pointed questions about the things you've already tried and ask for help from that perspective. Otherwise, they're going to roast you. Thank you guys so much. Let me know what other kind of content you want to see in the comments below, and we're going to see you next time. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. We appreciate each and every one of you guys. In the background here, you'll see more AI-generated art made by the Cynthia Bot right in our own Discord. If you want to join up and have your art featured on one of our videos, please just join the Discord, Squatchtopia Hangout. We'll have a link down below. And then 
in the AI image category, you can generate whatever you want. If you run into something that you really like, click the little tool emoji and then the little disc icon, that'll save it to the gallery. I go directly to the gallery to populate all the pictures that we use every week for our videos. Thanks again to all the Patreon support. You can see the Swamp Ape level people on screen now. Thank you so much for Aslu, Crunchy Peanut Butter, and Max for being on the Super Fan Squatch level. You guys are absolutely awesome. As always, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you've made it this far in the video, maybe watch another one right after. I know it helps the algorithm and it helps me out a ton. Thank you so much for watching. We're gonna catch you next time.